Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. This is the second of a multi-part series we're doing related to our new book, Islamic and Biblical Prophecies for the 21st Century. In the previous sermon, we covered seeing Christianity through Islamic eyes. This time, we're going to talk a bit more about prophecy, some stuff about Islam and women, and some other things that... Uh, probably you didn't know about the connections between Islam and uh, biblical Christianity. Now, Muslims refer to both Jesus and Muhammad as prophets. Jesus is also considered, according to Islam, to be the Messiah. But generally speaking, when they use the term the prophet, Muslims are referring to Muhammad. Now, Christians, Jews, and non-Muslims might wonder why Muslims seem so devout in their religion. One, of course, is because in the West, what many in the West no longer are is serious about their religion. But another reason seems to be that Islam believes that when he was alive, Muhammad gave various prophecies that took place in the centuries since. Not only some things when he was alive, but centuries after he was alive. So they believe that it's confirmed uh, that he was God's prophet. Uh, historical events, they think, is, have absolutely persuaded them of that. So they think that's the proof that theirs is the correct one. Of course, other groups have various other ways they believe uh, shows that God has approved them. Uh, for example, many of the Greco-Roman uh, Catholics assert that things such as apparitions, they claim could be Jesus' as mother Mary, the Apostle John, Jesus, etc. Bleeding Eucharistic hosts, uh, what they call stigmatics, these are people who claim to have the wounds of Jesus on their hands and other parts of their body. Incorruptibles, an incorruptible is somebody when they're buried, they don't de de uh, decompose. Uh, another proof that many use on the Greco-Roman side is the various prophecies from their seers, now they're called private prophecies. And so they think those and other wonders basically prove their faith. Now it should be uh, pointed out that even though uh, Greco-Roman Catholics have stigmatics, so actually do uh, uh, Muslims. They claim that some Muslims have the wounds of Muhammad that he suffered when he was trying to spread, spread Islam. Now as far as having incorruptibles go, uh, the uh, uh, Buddhists also have them, and actually supposedly a few Muslims who were buried were incorruptibles, but Muslims don't view the incorruptibles as proof. Anyway, like the Muslims, the, the Greco-Roman Catholics hold that theirs is the true faith, despite changes that they've made to it. But interestingly, when I did a lot of research on this, I found out that a lot of Roman Catholic scholars concluded that uh, uh, Muhammad was some type of a prophet, and they say some good things about him, such as that he helped eliminate uh, polytheism in the Arab world, and he had certain other positive impacts. Of course, one of the reasons they're doing that, or have done it, is throughout their history, the uh, Greco-Roman Catholics have hoped that somehow Islam is going to come to their faith. Now, getting back to Islam itself, Islam claims that Muhammad was the last of the prophets, uh, called the seal of the prophets in the Quran, in uh, chapter 33 called Surah. Is what they do. Instead of calling them chapters, they call them Surah. Surah 33, verse 40. Now, Muhammad himself reportedly, and I say reportedly because there's some controversy if he really said this himself, he said, reportedly said, there is no prophet after me. However, that differs from what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, for example, in Acts 2 verses 17 and 18, that there'll be uh, prophets in the last days. And also, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 3, it talks about God will raise up two witnesses who will prophesy for 1260 days. And that hasn't happened yet. And it certainly did not happen before the arrival of Muhammad. So there we see a divergence between what the Bible teaches and what Islam uh, tends to believe. Now regarding 
end times and prophecies, I want to read something that Harper Collins uh, uh, published. While Muslim apocalyptic thought is diverse and complex, most narratives contain some elements that would be easily recognized by Christians and Jews. At an undetermined time in the future, the world will end, a messianic figure will return to the earth, and God will pass judgment on all people. Now, for example, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Christians know that uh, Jesus ascended into uh, heaven and he would return. And Muslims believe that too, by the way. For another, they both also believe that Jesus was a prophet and that Jesus performed miracles. And they also believe that Jesus is going to defeat one, the beast that rises from the sea, in Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10, as well as the beast from the earth, which is Revelation uh, 13, 11 through uh, 16 or so. Now, the first beast is the one that a lot of Protestants and Roman Catholics uh, tend to call the Antichrist. But in Islamic literature, this being is referred to as the Dajjal. Uh, maybe I'm not pronouncing that right. I don't read Arabic. D, in English, it's spelled D-A-J-J-A-L. Anyway, the word Dajjal literally means deceiver. And in Islam, it's considered to be a reference to something called al masa ad dajjal which essentially means the Messiah of mixed deceptions. The Dajjal is expected to mix some truth in with error. And, you know, throughout history, a lot of people have been comfortable with that uh, because, according to the Bible, in 2 Thessalonians, they have insufficient love of the truth. And this is going to be one of the reasons why Islam believes that the Dajjal will actually be effective and successful for some period of time. And the uh, al Masi ad Dajjal shares some traits with the biblical uh, beast who's going to exalt himself as God, which you can read about in Daniel chapter 11, verses 36 through 37, as well as 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. And the, according to the Dajjal, according to Islam, excuse me, the Dajjal is expected by Muslim, Muslims to claim to be God. Now, I mentioned this book, and I guess I should tell people where you can get it. This book... Uh, it's free online at www.ccog.org. That's ccog.org. When you get there, go to our uh, literature tab, click under books and booklets, and various books will show up. You'll see the covers. We don't ask for money. Just click on them, and you can read them online. We don't ask for anything. You can read them, study them on your own. In case I go over something you want repeated or you want to learn more, etc. Now, Muslims claim that the Dajjal is going to be a Jew. Now, third century Roman Catholic bishop by the name of Hippolytus pointed to the beast who he said was not the false prophet of Revelation. And he, they said he was from the Israelite tribe of Dan. Now, in the Bible, we find out that the patriarch Jacob was renamed Israel by God in Genesis chapter 32 verse 28 and he was the father of the Jews as well as the tribe of Dan but the Bible itself does not say that the beast or the final antichrist is going to be a Jew or a descendant from the tribe of Dan but that is a tradition that the Roman Catholics have and it's similar to a tradition that the Muslims have now some Christians have actually pointed to the Habsburg uh, line as connected to the beast of Revelation, uh, being amongst the uh, uh, seven kings that would arise. Now, there's currently no conclusive proof that any of the Habsburg line has Jewish blood in it. But there's at least one living descendant of the Habsburg line. Uh, his descendant on his mother's side. And he has his name Jacob as part of his name, so, which would suggest a connection perhaps to the Jews. His actual, his full name, his very long name, is Carl Theodore Maria Nicholas Johann Jacob Philip Franz Joseph Sylvester uh, Friar von Un zu Gutenberg. 
Anyway, that said, since there are billions of people who are connected with religions that have prophetic beliefs, uh, we can understand that signs and prophecies, even for opposing religions, sometimes point to similar conclusions. And again, we see some similarities between uh, the Bible and the Quran. Part of the reason was that Muslims, particularly Muhammad, did have some familiarity with, with the Bible. Now the Bible points to uh, deceptive signs and uh, wonders uh, happening, as well as true ones, in the last days. And it's important to know, know the difference. And one of the ways you'll know the difference is, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, those who do not have sufficient love of the truth those who accept traditions over what the Word of God says are going to be deceived. Uh, now let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting to read in verse 7. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And basically that's what Islam says Jesus is going to do to the beast. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan's, Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. There'd be unrighteous deception. We have a booklet about the Ten Commandments of the Decalogue and the Beast, and in it we go through, and that's available by the way at ccg.org, that the Beast and the Antichrist are going to violate, or want people to violate all the Ten Commandments. According to Psalm 119 verse 172, all of God's commandments are righteousness. So he's going to use unrighteous deception. He's going to have people break the Ten Commandments, at least some of them are part of them. Or again, as we go into our Ten Commandments book, but actually all of them one way or the other. So that'll be a sign that he's not the one. doesn't matter what miracles uh, the beast and or the false prophet do. The fact that they will not be truly advocating God's Ten Commandments shows that they will be doing unrighteous deception, and that's how people would know the truth. Sadly, though, many people don't even understand the Ten Commandments, how they're to be kept, and so they will be also be deceived. Anyway, we receive, hear that, uh, that they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. So they'll think, oh, look at these signs and lying wonders. This is obviously supernatural. This is not a normal human thing. Obviously, we need to believe this. Yeah, yeah, they does not believe in keeping the Sabbath. And they tell you to covet. And they're killing people. And they dishonor God. They've got the image violating the second commandment, et cetera, et cetera. People say, yeah, but look at this. Anyway, God's going to send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They had pleasure in violating God's commandments and not keeping to God's Ten Commandments. And while we've had signs and lying wonders throughout history, this is going to intensify in the future. So much so that I'm convinced that many in Islam will temporarily, and I mean only temporarily, uh, except the coming beast power, consistent with what we just read in 2 Thessalonians 2, but only for a short period of time, as we read later in, uh, well, not later, in a different part of the Bible, in the prophecies of Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 43, that the uh, Islamic power and the European power will go to war against each other. Now, I want to go over something about how Muslims view the West. This is, comes from uh, Pew Research. It says, many in the West see Muslims as fanatical, violent, and lacking tolerance. Meanwhile, Muslims in the Middle East and Asia generally see Westerners as selfish, immoral, and greedy, as well as violent and fanatical. 
A rare point of agreement between Westerners and Muslims is that both believe that the Muslim nations should be more economically prosperous than they are today, but they gauge the problem quite differently. Muslim publics have, been, have an agreed view of the West. They're much more likely than Americans or Western Europeans to blame Westerner, Western policies for their lack of prosperity. For their part, Western publics uh, instead point to government corruption, lack of education, Islamic fundamentalism as the biggest obstacle to Muslim prosperity. Highlights in terms of the divide between Muslims and the West are uh, have happened through various things, such as when there have been depictions of Muhammad in, in cartoonish ways, and Muslims are totally offended by this. Uh, and this also this concludes with the chasm between Muslims and the West is also seen in judgments about uh, how these civilizations treat women. Western publics, by lopsided margins, don't think that Muslims are respectful of women, but half of or more in four of the five Muslim publics surveyed say the same thing about people in the West. And what does that got to do with it? Okay, so what they're saying is in half the Muslim countries Pew did this study on, four out of five Muslims said that how the West deals with women is, is just wrong. And of course you've got Westerners saying how Muslims deal with women is wrong. And actually on, on that last part, saw something today that over in Iran they're now starting to use artificial intelligence to check to see if uh, women in public are wearing a hijab which type of uh, covering and they want to enforce this and make these women do this whether they, they want to or not they don't they don't care they they're going to enforce this sometimes they beat women sometimes they kill them if some of them actually killed sometimes they imprison them to, but to make it easier to monitor they're going to try to put in uh, artificial intelligence I'm presuming with cameras now I want to before I go any further all Muslim nations do not require women to go around dressed like that but in Iran uh, that is something that they're trying to enforce now why does Islam think the Western view of women is wrong. Well, basically, Islam sees the West is using women as uh, sex objects uh, for marketing purposes and other types of things. Uh, they look at, say, look, even little girls are told to tr pretty much dress like prostitutes, and they uh, don't they 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 don't approve. They don't understand how uh, people, particularly people, who claim to be Christian and let their uh, daughters go out uh, looking like that. They, that doesn't make any sense to them. The, the, the women they, they should not be shown so much skin in public. Uh, so they don't understand how anyone who claims to believe the Bible could, uh, could allow such a thing. And of course, on that particular point, Islam is right. I'm going to go to First uh, Timothy chapter uh, 2, read some from the Apostle Paul. Starting in verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, I desire therefore, now let's go to verse 9, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, you know, not trying to uh, dress like harlots, with propriety and moderation. And, you know, Islam sees hypocrisy in Western religions that supposedly believe that Western females can dress the way many of them, many of them do. You know, Jesus taught, let's go there, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27. You've heard that it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, it's one of the Ten Commandments, you're not supposed to commit adultery. Jesus expanded this in verse 28. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In Islam, women are not supposed to publicly attempt to induce lust. Yet in the West, in its advertising, in entertainment, uh, in various social reasons, uh, females often will, will dress like that. Now, years back, the old uh, Worldwide Church of God put out an article uh, by uh, Keith Stump called Seeing the World Through Islamic Eyes. So I want to read what it has here about the role of women. 
Another sore point to Muslims is the West concept of the role of women in Islamic society. Many Westerners know, for example, that women in ultra-Orthodox places do not drive cars. They also know about the much publicized veil and the uh, shadar, which is a head to toe black garment. You see those sometimes in Muslim countries. Um, what Muslims and which Westerners would also realize is that the traditions or customs in one Middle Eastern country aren't necessarily the same in the other ones because all Muslim women uh, don't uh, dress like, have to dress like that. And actually when my wife uh, Joyce and I were in Turkey uh, one of the times, we uh, were talking to uh, our guide and he pointed to somebody in all black and says he doesn't, he's kind of was fearful of them in Turkey. I think he thought that they supported terrorists is the impression he gave me. But he said as far as the other gals wearing or not wearing this stuff, he says what happens in the poorer parts of Turkey is actually money comes in from the uh, oil exporting Muslim countries, the wealthier ones, to pay young women to wear that kind of covering. And if women don't have any money, the teenage gals, etc., don't have any money from some other source, they'll go ahead and do it. On the other hand, women who have more money, like poor, poor women who dress like that, <laughs> so they don't do it, unless they're uh, stricter on the Islam side. Uh, some of them do that. But I should comment, by the way, that the uh, Quran does not require women to, to wear the head covering things. They just say that women should dress uh, uh, modestly. Uh, again, the veil is not something that the Quran talks about. And according to uh, the old Worldwide Church Guide, it says it was introduced actually uh, in the Middle East in the 15th century, which is 800 years after Muhammad. So those who believe they're traditional Muslims following the original Islamic faith, that was not a requirement uh, back then. And uh, the Worldwide Church God also said that Muhammad actually advanced the status of women significantly. Uh, according to them, greater honor than most societies at his time. And this says here, here's a quote, O men, respect, they assume this is from Muhammad, but this is from the Quran, O men, respect women who have uh, bore you. Muslim women are generally given civil rights, property rights, uh, which was a revolutionary step, by the way, in the Arab world when uh, Muhammad introduced those things. But men are still considered uh, to a degree above women. As far as the practice of polygamy, uh, they, few Muslim men have as many wives as you're allowed. They're allowed four wives, by the way. Uh, most have uh, one. But it says if you have more than one, you have to treat them all without partiality, which is probably impossible, but that's what they say. So anyway, there's certain things that are not required on Islam, particularly what Iran is doing right now, but they do it anyway. Now, I've, perhaps you also mentioned that according to Muhammad, there, were, there have been four perfect women throughout history, at least through his time. First one listed was Jesus' mother, Mary. Okay, that's the one they actually tend to list first, sometimes some other ones. Another woman, or second one, usually was Muhammad's first wife. Thought she was perfect. Third one that's usually listed is the daughter of Pharaoh who drew Moses out of the water. She's considered one of the four perfect women in Islam. And the fourth one is Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. Now that's interesting. I plan on talking about Fatima later in this series, but if you heard of Fatima in Portugal and the miracle of the sun in Fatima and the appearances of a lady in Fatima back in 1917, that comes from the name of a Islamic princess who got the name from her ancestors because a lot of women in uh, Islam are named uh, Fatima is part of their name. Kind of like Roman Catholics use Mary or Maria in lots of names. A lot of the uh, Muslims will do this. And the town, of, the town of Fatima ended up being named after her. And I'll talk about Fatima in another time.
And one last thing uh, from the old World Watch Church of God, it says, in general, however, the Muslim attitude towards Christianity and Judaism is not inherently hostile. And I went through some of that last week, particularly saying that according to Islam, there are kind of like two types of Catholics. And I, well, well, not two types of Catholics, two types of uh, Christians in their, their view. Uh, one who uh, basically keeps to more of the original faith. They don't have idols, uh, don't eat pork, things like that. And then all the rest, which they put in a different, uh, different category. You know, Muhammad called Christians and Jews the people of the book. And as I read last time, they said, Muhammad said the people of the book are different. One of the things that he said, to refresh your memory from last time, is that our type of Christians, uh, you don't have to worry about fighting because we don't fight in battles. He said, you know, we, we can be a minor annoyance, but that was pretty much the worst thing he said, he said about us uh, back, back then. Now, getting back to this book, Chapter 3 I'm going to go into now is called Prophecy, Imam Mahdi, Peace Deal, the King of the South. Now, Islam, to a significant degree, considers itself to be a prophetic religion. Take it a step further, some have claimed Islam is a religion of all the prophets, basically meaning that all the biblical prophets uh, and any other true prophets were Muslim. Okay, they considered Abraham was Muslim, for example, uh, Isaac Jacob. Isaiah, Moses, uh, Jesus, uh, the apostles, uh, who were prophets, and all those. Now, when it comes to prophetic uh, events, uh, most Muslims seem to be looking for a leader who's supposed to arise in these end times. And he's sometimes called the Imam Mahdi. There was a poll done by Pew Research in most of the countries surveyed were in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. Half or more of the Muslims believe that they will personally witness the appearance of the Mahdi. In Islamic eschatology, in Islamic prophecy, he's a Masonic figure known as the Mahdi, or the guided one. And he is supposed to appear before the Day of Judgment. And so this is common in a variety of uh, Islamic uh, countries. And Imam Mahdi is believed to be a leader who's going to unite Muslims and eliminate Islamic prophecy. I mean, excuse me, poverty, I'm sorry. Now, although most Muslims believe or expect this Imam Mahdi is going to rise up, various Islamic scholars question that, say, well, he's really not mentioned in the Quran. In uh, the term Mahdi is not explicitly used actually in the Quran, but there you can be it can be derived some, from some things in the Quran, and there are a variety of differences within Islam. And some of the Sunnis don't believe there'll be an Imam Mahdi, but officially they also do believe there will be one. Now, in Islam, there are things called hadithic writings. So Islam has the Quran; and they have hadithic writings. It's not totally analogous, but similar to the fact that the Jews have the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and they have uh, the, the Talmud. Uh, this is not quite like that because the Jewish Talmud is various interpretations of rabbis of what the Bible is supposed to mean. Whereas with Islam, the Hadiths are supposed to basically be things that Muhammad said to other people who said to other people and then they put them in here. So, uh, sometimes it's just they're considered authentic hadiths because they know for sure or they think reasonably certain that this is what Muhammad said and it was just from one person to the other. Uh, but here's some of them that are a prophetic side, which is kind of interesting. Muhammad said, there'll be four peace agreements between you and the Roman Christians. The fourth agreement will be mediated through a person who is the progeny of the honorable Aaron, Moses' brother and it will be upheld for seven years. And here's another take of this. There'll be a treaty between you and the Romans, and they will betray you and march against you with 80 banners, under each of which will be 12,000 troops. And here's another hadith here. General anarchy bloodshed that no Arab household will be spared in it. Then 
a life of peace as a result of peace agreement between you and the, and the Romans, the Europeans, which they will break and attack you with force consisting of 80 flags and under each flag will be an army of 12,000 men. So I've read a couple of translations of this. Now, this is actually consistent with biblical prophecy to a degree anyway. If you've got your Bible, let's now go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. And we're going to start reading something in verse 26. It says, The people of the prince who is to come is going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it will be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, historically, this covenant for one week has been considered to be seven years, including, by the way, by Roman Catholic saints such as uh, uh, Hippolytus of the third century said this is seven years. Uh, uh, most Protestant scholars believe this means seven years. Uh, Church of God scholars have also said this means seven years. But notice, in the middle of the week, after three and a half years, he will bring an end to the sacrifice and offering and make things desolate. So we see a time element in here, and it's going to be broke. Sounds very similar to what Islam has. As I say, Islam was influenced by, uh, by the Bible. It was influenced by people we believe held uh, Church of God beliefs as well. Um, also, by the way, if you're a Greco-Roman Catholic or Protestant, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon also believed this was a seven-year deal, and uh, most Protestants considered Irenaeus to be uh, uh, a saint, at least their scholars did. And the fact that this deal is supposed to be made with many shows that there's more than one or two uh, nations or people are going to be involved. Now, this deal is made by one who is biblically called a prince. He's going to be some type of a leader of the coming f final uh, developing beast European Empire. Now, the reason that we know that this is a reference to the Roman Empire is because in the first century, the Roman Empire uh, fulfilled the first portion of it. Uh, they destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Okay, and that was done by uh, the, the Europeans. And that's going to happen. Uh, uh, something else is going to happen. A leader is going to rise up called a prince. Now, this person who's called a prince in Daniel 9:26, who confirms this deal for seven years, will later be the king of the north. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 31. He stops the deal. Now, there's a chance that this deal will not actually be a seven-year deal. He said, what you just said is to confirm the deal for a week. And he's going to confirm it for a week, but whether it's a seven-year deal or a 14-year deal or a nine-year deal, somehow some part's going to be confirmed for a week. We don't know all the details yet, and it's something that uh, perhaps we'll see happen uh, this year. And it's possible that when this deal is made, that one that might be called an Imam Mahdi, uh, who could be like the one the Bible calls the King of the South, might also be involved with this, this deal, but the Bible's not particularly specific on that part. Now, I'd like to read something from the uh, old Worldwide Church of God. It says, just as there is yet to be a final King of the North, called in the Bible, symbolism, the beast, He's, who's going to rise as a super dictator over an end-time European confederation, there will emerge in the same manner a final king of the south, an overall leader of an Arab Muslim confederation, possibly bearing the very title Mahdi. And these two individuals will eventually find themselves in a head-to-head -head devastating war in the Middle East. So while that was taught by the old worldwide Church of God, I haven't seen much from, other than from the continuing Church of God, other uh, Church of God groups saying much about tying the Imam Mahdi with the King of the South. But old Worldwide Church of God did. We do as well, uh, because there are some consistencies as well as inconsistencies. And so it's possible this person will call himself the Imam Mahdi, or some will at least refer to him as the Imam Mahdi. Anyway, the confirmation of some type of seven-year period uh, from some, probably some kind of a peace deal is an event that will set off what I would call 
the final clock on prophesied uh, and events, and this will point to uh, basically the United States and its British descended allies having about three and a half years before they get destroyed and conquered by uh, the European beast power. Uh, various uh, people outside the Church of God, uh, particularly various Protestants and some other Protestant watchers are also looking for this deal, but I think it's going to be not clear to everybody. And, you know, the Bible says in Habakkuk 1 verse 5 that even it will be told to people, but they won't believe it. And so I believe we're going to be telling people that this deal is going on. Uh, people will simply not believe it. And I mentioned before that the prince who becomes the king of the north, Daniel eleven thirty one, 31, he's going to, uh, says he's going to defile the sanctuary forces because he's moving into the Middle East. Basically breaks, breaks that part of the deal. Now, like the continuing Church of God, by the way, most Muslims believe that Jesus will return after some coming seven-year period. And we believe it's after this deal of Daniel 9.26 uh, is confirmed by the prince. Oh, I should also mention that, uh, like the continuing Church of God, Muslims don't believe that there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture like some of the Protestants hold to. We don't believe that. The Bible is clear that Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, uh, after the tribulation there will be signs in the heavens and then, then Jesus comes. Okay, so uh, Muslims also don't believe in free trip rapture just like we don't. A Roman Catholic uh, saint and doctor of their church, Jerome, late 4th, early 5th century, said something that differs from modern Roman Catholic writers, by the way. He said that many of the prophecies in Daniel 11 uh, are not considered to be anciently fulfilled, but that they're going to have future fulfillment. So Jerome said, look, yeah, some of these things happen, but many of our people believe, no, this is just a foretaste and this is going to happen in the future. Whereas I bought a modern Roman Catholic prophecy book that says, oh, this stuff is all for the past. That does have an imprimatur on it. But again, Jerome is considered a doctor of their church. So if you're Roman Catholic, I just want you to know that within the, the uh, general Roman Catholicism, ancient writings, some agree with the continuing Church of God that the prophecies in Daniel 11 are still to be fulfilled. Uh, Islamic prophecies also suggest a, a deal between the Roman Catholics and themselves. It's going to be a deceitful deal. And there's some other deceitful deals addressed in Scripture as well. Um, maybe I should point out that there's some Hadiths that point to Islam actually conquering uh, India, but biblical prophecies related to the king of the south, they don't look like they support that. However, it's possible that Muslims in Pakistan, perhaps even in India, uh, might support the coming king of the south, directly or indirectly. Uh, there have been talks that Pakistan might supply nuclear weapons, for example, to Saudi Arabia, etc. Now, Islam is basically divided into uh, uh, two or three pieces, depending on how you want to count it. One is the Sunni Muslims. They're the vast majority, between 80 and 90 percent, depending on how you count it. Then the Shiites, between 10 and 15 percent. And the rest are called Sufis, which are considered actually part of the Sunnis. So they're maybe 4 or 5 percent, or even less than that, maybe 2 percent. Now, the nation with the most Shiite Muslims is Iran. And they believe that uh, the human race needs a divinely guided one that they call the Imam Mahdi. And that we need these Imams in order to make things work. That's part of why over in Islam, the supreme leader is the Ayatollah, uh, even though they have a president and other types of things. And you know, the Imams are not only religious teachers, uh, they also are believed to have uh, prophetic significance. They're sub they are believed to be able to intercede for believers on Judgment Day. We don't teach that. We, there's only one intercessor, and that's Jesus, so we would not agree with, with that. But anyway, according to various ones in Shiite Islam, knowing the Iman is necessary for salvation. And the Bible says there's only one name under heaven by which you'd be saved, and that's 
Jesus uh, Christ of Nazareth, so that's, we don't believe that, so we don't agree with the uh, Shiites on that. They also believe that there's a hidden imam. Uh, his name is Muhammad al Montazar al Mahdi. They believe he is alive, uh, beginning in, uh, in, in what they call occultation, kind of like suspended animation, um, beginning in back in the year 872 AD, a long time ago. And sometimes he has a minor inculcation, inculcation so he could communicate with his followers through their representatives. And he's been in a major one since then, although uh, the Ayatollah has said he's seen him in some things like that. Uh, the Shiites claim descent through Muhammad's cousin Ali. Uh, and this is kind of how they differ from uh, the, the Sunnis. Because of how Shiites view the Imams, Sunni Muslims often consider the Shiites to be idolaters and polytheists. And in 2024, the Sunni connected group called Islamic State or ISIS, they went so far as to set off bombs in Iran to kill Shiites. Why? Because they called them polytheists. Okay, now most Sunnis aren't to that degree, but they do uh, don't they don't agree with uh, the Shiites. Uh, so that's one of the major differences between the Shiites and the, and the Sunnis. Now, Shiites actually claim that their Imam Mahdi is mentioned in Scripture. Uh, they say the Psalms of David uh, point to him. Uh, let's just I'll just read a couple of parts of this. Like for example, Psalm 96 it says, "He will judge the people fairly. The sky rejoices and the earth exerts." The sea roars, the desert and everything in it is delighting. Then all the trees will sing because he comes. We do not believe that's prophecy for the Imam Mahdi, but Shiite Muslims do. Uh, they cite the prophet Habakkuk. Though he may delay, wait for him. He will surely come and delay, and he will gather them all together. Uh, from uh, uh, chapter 2 of the book of Habakkuk. That is not what it's talking about at all. It's not talking about the Imam Mahdi. Uh, they point to Isaiah. Uh, the people of the universe will find peace in it. He is a man whom God has chosen and directed to conquer victory after victory to fulfill his real mission. Then, the same Shiite source claims Christianity from the book of Luke. Again, this is, I'm reading their translation of this. You should be like those who are waiting for their mistress to come back from wedding. So when he comes, he knocks on the door, he immediately opens the door for him. So you should also be ready because at a time when you do not think the Son of Man comes. So they're saying that the Son of Man is not Jesus, but that the Son of Man is the Iman Mahdi. They also promote the same thing from the gospel from Matthew's gospel. See the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, great power. They also uh, point to the Gospel of Mark. Jesus said, Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and to save many. But Jesus was talking about himself, not to the, the people pretending to be Jesus, not that they're going to pretend to be the Imam Mahdi. Then the, the Gospel of John, they quote that too. He's given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Do not be amazed at this, for time is coming when all in their graves will hear his voice and come out. No, people are not going to be resurrected by hearing the voice of an Imam Mahdi, but instead of uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, then he quote Apostle Paul. They don't say which epistle it says. One who will rise and rule over the nations, in him the Gentiles will hope. But that's it. Actually, you're getting the reference to Jesus. Then they say they have speeches about him. Uh, Matthew uh, 24, and I actually referred to this part, starting verse 27, this says, For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. 
Then there will appear in heaven the signs of the Son of Man, that all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, power and great glory. Now, most Sunni Muslims do not believe that the Imam Mahdi is going to come down from the sky or all this kind of stuff. And I could go on for more of those quotes, but they're in this particular uh, book that we have, so you can, you can read it. Anyway, Jews and Christians would not agree that these passages are references to the Imam Mahdi, nor do I think would most Sunni Muslims. Uh, you know, we Christians consider the Son of Man to be Jesus. He repeatedly referred to himself that way. I'll read part of this list so you see how repeated. Matthew 8, 20, 9, 6, 11, 19, 12, 8, 12, 40, chapter 16, 28, 17, 9, 17, 12, 20, 18, 24, 27, 24, 30. That was just in Matthew's account. We could go on and on, but we do that. As far as the book of Habakkuk goes, the second chapter discusses what's going to happen to a highly indebted nation. It's not a reference to the coming of the Imam Mahdi. Now that said, Muslims, whether they're Shiite or Sunni, or Sufi for that matter, may refer to some of those passages of, of biblical importance when a pan-nationalistic Islamic leader rises up once he's on the scene. Again, the Bible does talk about some with some similarities to the Imam Mahdi, but we're talking about that from actually the 30th chapter of the book of Ezekiel and the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel. Now here's something about the Mahdi. Uh, the Mahdi shall be from Al-Habat Beit. Allah will rectify him one night and make him good in one night. So Muslim scholars interpret this to mean the guy who's going to be the Imam Mahdi was not necessarily that great of a Muslim. So it doesn't matter that he had a bad background. But he's going to get changed to become a very good Muslim, in their view. And he also he believes he will be alive when the Dajjal, the beast, is alive. And uh, here's what they say is going to happen before he arises. It says, conditions before the advent of al-Mahdi. Amongst other things, Injustice, harm, starvation, murder, and continuing trials will be prevalent, and religious innovations common. Forbidden things will be practiced, and it will be said that wine, wine is permitted, and most don't pray. Well, some of that is consistent with what Jesus said was going to happen in the end times, about uh, starvation. Jesus talked about uh, hunger, famines, in uh, Matthew 24, verse 7. And the apostle... Paul wrote about selfishness and various, selfish, selfishness and various forms of uh, uh, immorality in the last days in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Peter chapter, not Peter, Timothy uh, 3. Uh, many uh, Muslims have uh, rightly denounced uh, the West for their immor immorality and depravity. And uh, I saw something that Ursa Erdogan She's the daughter of the Turkish uh, president. She even declared that the moral Western values will result in the ultimate victory of Islam, the Islamic crescent over the cross of the West. Now, some believe that uh, Muslims are going to accomplish that. The Mahdi is going to do that, but the Bible shows a different re end result for the crescent. But it does also say the cross will point to the cross ending as well. Now here's some traditions that Muslims have about the Imam Mahdi. It says he's described in detail. He'll have brown eyes. Well, most Arabs do that. Teeth of extreme whiteness. In modern times, that's more possible than it was in ancient times. A beauty mark on his cheek. He'll be born of a slave girl. There's some controversy as to about where she, he's going to appear. Some say Morocco, some say Kufa, some say Damascus, but there's other possible places. In traditions from Muhammad, it's believed that the Mahdi will appear at a time of anarchy and chaos toward the end of the world. Or from a biblical perspective, we would probably refer to that as the beginning of sorrows. Uh, we know the king of the south is going to rise prior to the uh, start of the Great Tribulation, 
and so he'd be rise during the beginning of sorrows. Now here's some other uh, hadiths talking about the Imam Mahdi. Muhammad said, the Mahdi will be of my family, of the descendant of Fatima. The Prophet said, the Mahdi will be of my stock and have a broad forehead and a prominent nose. He'll fill the earth with equity and justice and he will rule for seven years. Uh, other prophets, other things also say seven years. I don't think so. I don't think it'll be that long, but that's what it says. Just some other things about him. They will fight one another for your treasures. Each one of them, a son of the caliphs, or caliphs, have none to gain. Then black banners will come from the east, and they'll kill you in an unprecedented manner. This is actually one of the reasons why groups like the Islamic State have used black banners. They think that they're going to help make some of these prophecies come to pass. So some caliphs says there'll be, in the last days, one who's going to distribute wealth without counting it. So he's believed he's going to bring prosperity in. He says, Muhammad looked for from the room. We were talking about the hour. He said, the hour will not begin until there are Ten signs of the Dajjal, the false Christ. The smoke, the rising up of the sun from the west. He also said to be uh, black flags that will arise from the area which looks to be uh, Iran, Turkmenistan, and Afghanistan. There's supposed to come a time of turmoil. And it says, Mahdi, sometime after he's being in place, is expected to basically eliminate Islamic poverty and hunger. And I've said that before. And I don't believe, based on biblical prophecies, he'll be in place for seven, seven years. But I want to read something from the New Encyclopedia of Islam. The last days are described in Islam as marked by the figures of Gog and Magog, called Jews and the Jews, the Mahdi, the Antichrist, Dajjal, and Jesus. Uh, at the same time, uh, there'll be a return to uh, spiritual integrity. So the same is going to be good and bad at the same time in Islam. The reign of the Mahdi is, is going to be called the rightly guided one. It'll be followed by that of the Antichrist. And then after Antichrist is led away with his followers, Jesus will return and destroy the Antichrist. But it also says belief in the Mahdi has been rejected by Sunni sources. And back in a book I wrote in 2009, I warned Sunnis, and I'll do it right now, don't think somebody who rises up who will be the biblical king of the south is this Mahdi savior. He's not going to save you. There might be some similarities, but they're simply not going to do this. So, Jesus talked about the beginning of sorrows. There'll be wars, rumors of wars, etc. Nations are going to go against nations. In famines, there'll be great signs. Well, there's a hadith that says, the hour will not come until there's earthquakes become many and senseless killing continues. Now that's actually similar to some Roman Catholic prophecies. So the hour will not come till there's earthquake. Excuse me. Sorry. I read that one. That chastisement will come when a very large number of bad books have been written and there's horrible books. Intellectuals are going to argue uh, and they'll see the rise of the great monarch. Now we put out books uh, uh, that go into great detail, by the way, about prophecy. We also have some explaining who the original Catholic Church is, what the police original Catholic Church was, and that the, the current Greco Roman Catholic Churches don't hold those beliefs. So I think that's the prophecy related to us. But the great monarch is one, it's sort of the Roman Catholic equivalent of an Iman Mahdi. We believe, however, this figure is the beast. Uh, there's many prophecies about the Imam Mahdi that the Greco Roman Catholics have that are similar to the beast one. And just like I just said, Sunni Muslims should not think the Imam Mahdi is coming is going to help them. Greco Roman Catholics, everybody else, should not accept that the great monarch is also going to lead to their salvation. But a lot of people will do that. Now, I mentioned something about uh, uh, bad books. Well, I, I think these books they're worried about are going to contain knowledge. And within Islam, uh, we know it says that the hour will not come until knowledge is taken. So that's talking about, I think, censorship, which we're starting to see more censorship here. Uh, we know, by the way, that censorship is prophesied in the Bible. 
in the Old Testament, let's go to the book of Amos, chapter 8. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that will send a famine of the land, not a famine of bread, nor of water, thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall, not, they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, and not find it. So I think that's consistent with the uh, Islamic Hadith. And I think this is talking about a time of censoring of biblical knowledge, because that's the word of the Lord. Uh, it be done on the media, the internet, and various other ways. Now, various other hadiths point to the time will come when the Quran will be taken and uh, Islam will be wiped away. Now, that's consistent, by the way, with some of the prophecies that the Greco-Romans have about this great monarch rising up. Here's one from somebody from the 15th century. The great monarch will destroy... Muhammad's sect and the rest of the infidels. He will annihilate all heresies and tyrants of the world. Well, he's going to be a tyrant, but this is what they teach. Here's one from the 14th century. The great monarch will drive the crescent from Europe, where none but the Christians will remain. He will rule from Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul, and bring in an air of uh, peace and prosperity. Uh, and God will raise up a holy pope. Well, in order to get rid of all heresies, as they're going to call it, you'd have to have some type of censorship. And again, that's consistent with the Bible. It's consistent with Islamic prophecy. And we're already, you know, starting to see some of that in place. Now, I mentioned some prophetic similarities. In the Quran, in Surah 82, verses 1 through 3, it says, When the sky splits open, and the stars fall away, then the seas burst forth. And I mentioned this one before, but Jesus talked in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. That's also consistent with the Quran, Surah 56. When the earth will be violently shaken, and the mountains will be crushed to pieces. Why do I keep talking about this stuff with Islam? First of all, there's two billion Muslims, and they're going to see some of their prophecies partially fulfilled. We need to realize, we want everybody to realize that biblical prophecies are ones to pay most attention to. Uh, in Revelation 16, for example, starting in verse 18, you don't have to go there, but we read there's going to be great noises and thunderings and lightnings, and a great earthquake, great city was. Uh, destroyed uh, into three, divided in three parts islands fled away and mountains were now found again that's consistent with the Surah uh, 56 that I just read and the Quran says that uh, when the earth is shaken to its depths mountains will be crumpled and so it says that uh, uh, it's a day whereupon men will be like moss scattered on the mountains like wool so again, we've got a lot of different uh, similarities. Now, what about the timing of the Imam Mahdi? When is he supposed to arise? Well, uh, one Muslim source said the second coming in the, in the Mahdi would happen in the year 2023. Now, back in 2022 and 2023, by the way, I denounced that I said that wasn't going to happen. At this instant, in 2024, the earliest date for Jesus' return is going to be 2031, and that's only if certain things happen in 2024. We'll have to we'll have to see. But just like every year, I find basically Protestants and some people who claim to be in the Church of God who say this tribulation started about to start, or Jesus is going to come, or the rapture is going to happen. They've got it wrong because they're looking at the wrong thing. Uh, there's a couple uh, hadiths about this. Uh, uh, Mahdi person says uh, you'll make a peace deal with the Byzantines and then they're going to fight you and I talked to you about that already but it also says another place there will be an alliance between the Muslims and the Ro Romans to fight a major enemy now who could be a major enemy with their fight well let's talk about something here let's go to Daniel chapter 11 
In verse 15, we read about a king of the uh, north. He's going to divide plants against the strongholds in verse 24. Okay. And then, verse 25, there's the king of the south. Verse 27, both these kings are going to have their hearts bent on evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper. For at the end times, for the appointed time. So there's a lying deal that's going to take place between the biblical king of the south, which I believe is the equivalent of the, some, has some equivalency to Imam Mahdi, as did the old uh, worldwide church of God, and the power from Europe. Now the Bible talks about the king of the north in Daniel 11.39 going against the strongest fortresses and that would be a major power. Now I went and I spoke to a, a caretaker of a local mosque a, a couple months back and he wanted me to watch some or pay attention to some writings or some prophecies or some messages particularly from somebody called Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussein. So he said, I'd have a better understanding of Islamic prophecy. And in one of those lectures, that sheikh says, how do you explain a little island in Europe establishes rule over the whole world, Pax Britannica? Well, various Muslims said there's a prophecy about an island of the Dajjal, which apparently this uh, Iman, uh, uh, Imran sheikh connects to Britain. But he also claimed this was based on an explanation from Muhammad. And then he also stated in one of his lectures that, that, that the USA took over uh, leadership after Britain. Now those of us who accept the end time application of certain biblical prophecies, for example, in the 48th and 49th chapters of the book of Genesis, we believe that the rise of uh, Great Britain, biblical Ephraim, and the USA, prophetic Manasseh, prophetic uh, Samaria, were, uh, were prophesied to be a multitude of nations and a great nation in Genesis chapter 48, verse 19. And we have a book on that about the lost tribes. So while well, this sheikh said he gets it from uh, Muhammad, and only Muhammad knew, uh, no, this was actually also from the Bible. Now, I haven't read other Islamic sources say it only came from Muhammad. But the one I was advised to listen to did say you uh, got that from Muhammad. Yeah, and here's another part he said, the sheikh said, Can anyone explain the USA's connection to Israel? None can explain except a man named Muhammad. Uh, no, we can explain. Why? Because of the tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh, are brothers to Judah. The nation, tiny nation now called Israel, is descendant of Judah. And so there's a sibling relationship, and that's part of the reason that there's a relationship between uh, the U.S. and uh, the nation of Israel. This was, has been explained since before this sheet made this particular uh, uh, message. I don't know if they call those sermons or what they call the lecture. I'll call it a lecture for lack of a better term. It was fairly long. It's like an hour and a half or so. Uh, but we go into more detail biblically why there's a connection between uh, the, the U.S. Uh, British descended allies as well as uh, the tiny nation of, of, of Judah. But we also point to biblical prophecies that these three peoples are later going to turn on against each other, for example in Isaiah uh, 2 verse uh, 21. And this eventually means that the USA is going to turn against the UK and its British descended allies and uh, vice versa. That also, by the way, looks to be consistent with the Greco-Roman prophecy back in the 6th century. Now, when I asked this sheikh in writing which of the surahs or hadiths supported what he had to say, he responded with, if you're searching for a hadith which declare, which is below, I know of none. Thank you for your email. Hope you can find another scholar more learned than I who can help you. So one of the issues I've run into with Islam is that various teachers have made various bold assertions which seem to be accepted because of traditions or personal feelings as opposed to being actually from Muhammad or from the Hadiths. And of course, we see the same thing in the Greco-Roman Catholic and Protestant world. There's a lot of traditions they hold to that they were taught by various ones that don't come from the Bible. And uh, you try to tell them something and they say, oh no, this really means this. 
In other words, even though the Bible says X, it doesn't really mean that. It means this because this is what we were taught it meant, even though that's not what it means. So anyway, related to the Sheikh's lecture, I did a lot of research, and I was able to find some of these, sometimes parts of the Quran, that supported some of what he said, but it wasn't nearly as direct as uh, he pointed out. But interestingly, in that lecture, the Sheikh also said, the United States is flying high now, but it's about to crash. It's going to end. And yes, the Bible says that. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 39, it talks about the king of the north going against the strongest fortresses. Uh, he's going to conquer them and divide their land for gain. Well, in the 21st century right now, which power has the strongest fortresses? The United States. I read back in Daniel 11, uh, verses 24, 25, that the king of the north is going to make a deal with the king of the south and devise th plans against the strongest fortresses. This will be Islamic uh, uh, compliance. Uh, compliance isn't really the word. Complicity is the word I was trying to say or think of. Uh, going against the United States. Uh, he also, uh, well, he couldn't come up with certain things in the Quran on some of this. I found something from Surah number 17, verses 4 to 5. It says, and we war, warn the children of Israel in Scripture, you will certainly cause corruption in the land twice, and you will become extremely arrogant. When the first two warnings should come to pass, we should send against you some of our servants of a great might who will ravage your homes. This will be a warning fulfilled. So this is consistent with the his idea that the United States is going to come to an end. And I think it's consistent with the idea that uh, the Muslim, various Muslims will work with the King of the North against the United States. Now in that lecture, the Sheikh said also, the this writing is on the wall. A new international monetary system is around the corner and in which the US dollar will disappear and when the U.S. dollar crashes, the American economy will crash with it. Now, we in the United States have long warned that the United States dollar is going to get to the point which is not going to be worth more than the cotton paper that it's printed on. Why do we say that? Because I mentioned Habakkuk 2 before. Habakkuk 2 says it's going to take place in the t end time, the appointed time of the end. That's one of the reasons why some Muslims have said, ah, this has got to do with the Imam Mahdi, because you the point of time at the end. But if you go down to verses 6, 7, and 8, it says, Woe to him who loads up pledges to himself, takes on many pledges. Will not your creditors rise up against you suddenly, and you'd be no more? Well, what nation has the most pledges of any in the history of humanity? Right now, the United States of America. And we call those, tre those uh, pledges treasury notes, treasury bonds, and things like that. But those are going to uh, one day uh, be uh, less than worthless. So I started to refer to certain things, and I'll refer to more in the future sermons. But I should mention that after the destruction of the United States, that happens in Daniel 11, verse 39, the Bible says that the king of the north will turn against the king of the south and uh, conquer it. And it talks about lands. Uh, such as uh, Egypt, Libya, which basically means lands that are uh, west of Egypt. It doesn't necessarily mean the, the nation of Egypt. It also talks about Kushites, which basically would be people uh, in Sudan, the Sudanese. And it also talks about some other peoples that uh, would include uh, the Arabic peoples in some of the Arab lands. So while the Bible does talk about a leader of those lands rising up, it talks about the destruction coming. And we also see from Islamic prophecy that they do believe that there's some kind of deal that's going to be made between the Muslims and the Europeans to go against uh, the, uh, a great power. And I agree with the Sheik that it will, that will be against the United States. I believe that other things will be done. I'm going to talk about other parts of these deals uh, in the future. But for right now, which things to realize is that one, when Islam looks at the West, 
It sees immorality. It sees underdressed women. It sees women being exploited as sex objects. Yet, they in Iran, they go op the opposite extreme, definitely beyond uh, the Bible. And again, not even the Quran requires uh, the Hadith, that type of a thing. But make no doubt about it, we are getting closer to the end times. Biblical prophecies will come to pass. And the Bible warns that many are going to be deceived when they see signs and lying wonders. Why? Because they didn't have the love of the truth. They didn't believe they needed to keep God's Ten Commandments. Hopefully, however, you're not amongst them, but you will try to keep them and strive to keep them as well. So when these signs and lying wonders do rise up, the Greco Roman Catholics and the Muslims are going to say these are their proof. Don't fall for it. Until next time, I hope to do more on this topic. This is uh, uh, Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.